Hey, everybody, just another minute, and then we'll get started. <clears throat> Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us. My name is Chris Bonamy. I am the Deputy Director for the DuPage County Stormwater Management Department, and we are here for a Protecting Water Quality from Home webinar. Uh, during this free webinar, attendees will learn about tips on native gardens, composting, rain barrels, and other things you can do to reduce pollutants uh, from reaching our local waterways. Uh, we have several of these workshops and webinars throughout the year. We find that they are a great way to connect like-minded organizations and individuals who are concerned with protecting our water quality in our local lakes, rivers, and streams. Uh, these workshops are part of our public outreach and education programs, and they help us meet our permit, our ILR 40 permit with the Illinois Environmental Protection Agency. Um, typically, we have these workshops in person, but due to COVID-19, we're using Zoom meetings as our platform to host this webinar. Hopefully, everything goes without any technical difficulties, but if we do have some, please be patient and we'll get them rectified as soon as possible. Uh, before we begin, I just want to throw out a couple thank yous. First of all, thank you to Mary Mitros. She is our stormwater communications supervisor at the county, and she is behind the scenes running the show today. I'd also like to thank the Conservation Foundation. They are our partners for all of these workshops, uh, specifically Jan Rail. Jan is the DuPage County Program Director for the foundation, uh, and she helped line up the speakers for our program today. Uh, and, and obviously, once again, I'd like to thank all of you for joining us this afternoon. Uh, you know, these are unprecedented times for all of us. There's uncertainty and disruption in our lives due to the global COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we hope that everyone continues to practice good hygiene by washing their hands frequently, uh, social distancing, uh, wearing a mask. If you can't social distance and if you do feel sick or ill, uh, please isolate or quarantine yourself so that we can prevent the further spread of this coronavirus. You know, just on a side note, um, I hope that all the mothers with us this afternoon had a wonderful Mother's Day last Sunday. Uh, I know it was good for us as we finally got to spend a little more time uh, as a family together. Um, I know my wife enjoyed it. By noon, she had a glass of wine in each hand uh, and she defended herself by saying it was for good hygiene and preventing her from touching her face. Uh, I don't know if I'd buy that or not, but uh, uh, the wine seemed to get to her a little bit because later that evening, she requested that I practice better social distancing from the refrigerator. Um, I guess maybe I put on a couple pounds since the beginning of this pandemic, maybe three years ago. I don't know. Anyway, none of that is important right now. What is important is that we have two great speakers with us this afternoon to tell us about what we can do to protect water quality at home. Uh, we have Jim Kleinwachter from the Conservation Foundation and Kay McKean from SCARES. And SCARES st stands for School and Community Assistance for Recycling and Composting Education. Uh, but before I turn things over to them, uh, I want to tell you about our chat feature. Um, uh, if you do have any questions or comments during the presentations, you can type them directly into the chat box and we will relay those comments and questions on to the speakers at the end of their presentations. And we'll get to as many of those questions uh, as time will allow. 
Okay, so oh, I can see a, a comment coming in from one of my coworkers. Uh, looks like this is from my friend Christine. Let's see what she has to say. It says, Chris, don't take this the wrong way, but you have a face much more suited for conference calls than for webinars. Okay, uh, not really what I was uh, expecting, but a point well taken. So um, I will get my face off of this screen and turn things over to our first presenter. And our first presenter is gonna be Kay McKean. She is the founder and executive director of Scarce. Uh, she founded Scarce almost 30 years ago. Uh, Scarce is an award-winning environmental education nonprofit organization dedicated to, to creating sustainable communities. Uh, she is also a commissioner on the City of Wheaton's Environmental Commission since 1984. Uh, she's also been a volunteer with the commission since 1981. And if my math is correct, that's about 39 years. Uh, she and her husband, Greg, have two adult children and five grandkids that all live in the area. And this is who she loves to spend time with uh, outdoors. Uh, so with that, uh, Kay is going to tell us about the importance of water quality at home. Uh, and so with that, uh, let's turn things over to Kay. Hi, everybody. I'm really, really excited to be here today with this webinar and be with this great group of people. Um, Scarce is um, delighted and grateful that we are able to work so closely with DuPage County Stormwater Department. We've been working together for several years now. We've created some really unique and award-winning programs, and we're really proud of all of that. We do a lot of education for teachers about water quality. In this slide, you can see teachers were learning about groundwater and how the water flows under the ground. Um, we had a donation of 56 models, so we were able to give those models to each of the teachers for their schools. It was a great project. We teach a lot of kids as well, and whenever you're recycling, you're saving water and you're helping to protect water quality. And then the last picture up there shows all the flags. We have the earth flag that we've been working with the county for a while. And we have the new water quality flag that has been earned by schools and libraries and park districts. And we're really proud of all that. Education is always the key if we want people to make changes. So we're really excited to be here today. This is the flag that we designed together with the county. Um, it shows three main watersheds that we have here in DuPage County. The Salt Creek, the East Branch of the DuPage, and the West Branch of the DuPage. So there's three waves. And schools and libraries, as I said, can earn it after they do a bunch of different steps to um, learn about water quality and they take action about how they can protect it. We know that everybody's concerned about water, maybe even more right now, but clean water, it's really what we need to have a healthy life. Um, washing our hands, as Chris said earlier, water to drink, all of those things, water for our plants, water for everything. So keeping water clean is something that benefits all of us today and in the future. The Great Lakes have 20 to 21 percent of the world's surface fresh water, which is pretty amazing that we're about 30 miles from there. It's wonderful to have that much fresh water close to us, but we need to realize that Americans are less than 5 percent of the world's population. Canada is less than 1 percent. So together, uh, less than 6 percent of the entire world's population has access, control, and responsibility to keep that water as clean as possible. We know that Lake Michigan is very full right now, and we've been seeing on the news the damage that uh, water can cause. Water is very, very powerful, so erosion and beach control, um, losing whole boardwalks. Uh, we're in a difficult time right now. The climate change is having bigger rain events, and so we've got a lot to learn in ways that we can protect our water at home and through our communities. So these are the watersheds that I was talking about in DuPage County, um, and they really all drain down uh, and eventually end up in the Illinois River and the Illinois to the Mississippi and then the Mississippi, of course, to the Gulf of Mexico. So what we do in our own homes, what we do in our parking lots, what we do in our businesses and our churches, it has a huge impact on the world. Um, and we want to make sure that we're being responsible and taking as much care of the water supply as we can. So when we see it drain all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico, you can see what a huge area that funnel almost is. Two provinces of Canada and all of these states all drain to the Mississippi. So when you hear about flooding uh, in the Gulf of Mexico area, Louisiana, Mississippi, those kinds of things, we are all contributors of that snow and that rain and that water that goes down our drains. It's really something to think about that we actually have a huge impact because that water leaves the Gulf of Mexico 
to the Atlantic Ocean and travels around the world. So we have a big responsibility to conserve it and to keep it as clean as possible. So we all live downstream from somebody and I don't know what you want to have in your, in your water, in your rivers, in your streams. So this is something that we should take very personally um, about what we're doing to our yards, what we're doing in our homes to protect that water quality. Indoor, there's a lot of things that we can look at and think about what we do inside of our homes to protect water. For instance, medicine disposal. All of us probably have outdated prescription medicine, um, expired aspirins or vitamins, maybe leftover dog medicine or cat medicine. All of that medicine needs to be taken to a police department or other facility to have it properly handled. It's important to not flush it down the toilets or pour cough medicine with codeine down the drain. All of that water, it does go to the Water Sanitary Treatment Center, but we have no way to get all of that medicine out of our water. So these facilities um, are open at the police departments 24 hours a day. And there's a big list on our website that tells people which police stations, which Walgreens um, have opportunities for people to drop off their medicine. The hazardous waste site in Naperville, the regional hazardous waste site, it reopened this past Mother's Day weekend. And so Saturdays and Sundays from nine to two, it's a place to bring unwanted medicine so it doesn't get into our water. We wanna look at the supplies that we buy to clean our homes, read the labels. If it's a label that says how toxic it is, how poisonous it is, how many uh, fumes are in it, that kind of thing, we want to maybe think about different products to clean in our home. So peroxide is a great thing to clean within our home and it doesn't hurt our water supply. Vinegar, salt, lemon, and lemon juice. Those are all cleaning supplies that our grandmothers used. Uh, maybe our grandmother, great grandmothers as well, but they're safer for the water, safer for our families as well. And I mentioned the hazardous waste site in Naperville. It is reopened. We have the best one in the Midwest. Uh, we have Chief Rick Sakaris who runs it, and I'm sure that's a big part of why it's the best. But Saturdays and Sundays, you can bring oil-based paints and things that you find in the kitchen sink or under, in the utility room, in the garage, or in the shed. Something that should not go into our landfills and should not go down the drain. This is what they specialize in, so we want to bring things there so we can protect our water and our air quality. We take cooking oil at the hazardous waste site, not because it's toxic, but because it causes huge clogs in our drains. All of those pipes, you can see that picture with all that white gunk in it. When bacon grease and cooking oils go down our drains, they get stuck in those drains. And that impacts our water quality because eventually those pipes are going to break. Or when we have a big surge of water with flooding, it pushes those pipes clean and it actually looks like golf balls and snowballs on the lawns at Water Sanitary Treatment Center. So we want to make sure we don't put cooking oil, vegetable cooking oil, down the drain ever. So what did we do? We helped write a law. And we here in DuPage County have 10 locations for people to drop off their cooking oil. That cooking oil is going to become new fuel for vehicles, planes, and cars. So it has a second use. It actually gets recycled and it doesn't get wasted. These are the 10 locations that we have around the county for people to drop off their cooking oil, vegetable cooking oil, liquids. And those sites, some of them are open again now and some will be opening, I'm thinking in June. It's a great way to protect water quality and make something that helps run our cars and planes a lot cleaner. There's no fee and you don't even have to live in the towns where the drop off centers are. Anybody can go to any of these sites and drop off unwanted, used, expired cooking oil to protect our water. Right now, a lot of people um, are using those hand wipes at the stores and at home and in our cars. This is one of the worst things for our drains. They should never be flushed down the toilet. Um, they stick that cooking oil and cause the clogs to be much worse. These, some of the packages tell you that they're flushable. Well, they do go down the toilet, but they are not going to go very far. So it could back up within your own home and be very expensive and very messy or it can go further down the street and cause our communities a big backup and damage our water. So make sure that these go in the garbage where they belong. Keep a bag in your car if you need to so that when you're done with those gloves and the disposable masks and these wipes that they don't become litter. Garbage disposals, a lot of people have them in their homes, but I don't. I haven't had one for 30 years. Garbage disposals use about eight gallons of water. 
to flush just one pound of food down the garbage disposal. So it's a tremendous amount of water. The food that we're putting down the garbage disposal is mostly water, about 90%. So we're using a lot of water to flush a lot of water down the, down the drain. And it goes to the Water Sanitary Treatment Center where amazingly, we find out that that food has a lot of nitrogen in it. So when we're talking about nitrogen and algae blooms and things, every garbage disposal that we're sending food down is hurting our water in our rivers and streams. Look at this picture. Those algae blooms from too much fertilizer, garbage disposals and those kinds of things. It has a definite impact on our water quality and all of the amphibians and the creatures that need our water. It's always great if you can to buy organic food. Um, it's better for you probably in the long run. It's definitely better for the farmers who don't have to use synthetic chemicals. It's definitely better for all the farm workers and it's for sure better for our soil and our water and water quality. It's an easy choice to make. When we're out teaching in schools and churches and libraries and park districts, we bring um, our watershed model. It's an award-winning exhibit. It's a hands-on kind of model. And people learn how we impact our water almost every day. And we really haven't thought about it till we see this bird's eye view of, if you will, of a community. It's a great tool and we bring it with us and we teach teachers. It's really great for people who have hands-on education. Here's some of the kids at one of the schools working with it. Everybody who participates in water shed model training has a different contaminant in a little shaker jar. So cocoa is really what we use, but it looks like it's soil for soil erosion. We have different colors of Kool-Aid to indicate uh, hazardous waste, pesticides, fertilizers, dog dew, and those kinds of things because all of that impacts our water quality. It's amazing when kids are the polluters and then see what that ha what becomes of it. They really learn a lot. So that's kind of indoor stuff. What can we do outdoor to help protect our water? What are those best management practices that a lot of people don't think about in their own yards, but it's some things that we can do pretty easily. Get a rain barrel. Rain barrels are just an easy way to slow down stormwater. The Conservation Foundation has rain barrels. Cantini has rain barrels. There's rain barrels at stores. It's definitely a way to slow down water and a great water to use to water your plants in your own yard. When the schools, libraries, churches, whomever work on earning our water quality flag, um, DuPage County gives us a rain barrel to give to them. And then the students and the art teachers work together to create a piece of art. Uh, not that all the schools can use them on their storm drains, but for kids to learn that there is something each of us can do in each of our homes to slow down storm water. So that's some kids in um, Carroll Stream School District 93 with their rain barrels. And then of course the DuPage Water Commission, we like to bring teachers there and groups there for tours. Look at their huge cisterns. Uh, really will hold a tremendous amount of water off of one of their buildings, slow it down so we can release it slowly after the rain event and reduce flooding. We like to teach people about permeable pavers and when we're in different towns, Downers Grove and Warrenville and Villa Park, um, we like to teach people about the permeable pavers right in their own communities that are being used to slow down stormwater, to send stormwater back down under the ground and reduce flooding. And those curb cuts at the Arboretum in different places, a way to send that water off of the permeable pavers into a bioswale filled with native plants and deep roots, slow down the storm water, absorb some of those pollutants before it goes down into the ground. It's kind of how um, permeable pavers work. A lot of people have seen bricks and they're thinking that those bricks that are in concrete are permeable pavers, but we need the open spaces between those bricks so that the water can go through, work its way down through different sizes of rocks and slow down that storm water. One of the buildings near the county actually, a uh, restaurant has underground storm water storage. Um, it's under their parking lot and I was able to see it as it was being built Amazing, the pipes are so big, I can walk through them. So it's under all of their parking lot and it can hold five feet of water in each of those pipes. That definitely reduces flooding, slows down that water so we can have a healthier water supply. Some of our schools, some of our homes have green roofs here in DuPage County. The Chicagoland area for a long time had the most green roofs in the whole country. Uh, it's a really great way to slow down stormwater, to clean water, 
It's a great way to save energy in the buildings, reduce the amount of heat that's needed in the winter, reduce the amount of cooling, and it's habitat for different creatures, insects, birds, and so forth. Great project to have for a school or a library. The Addison Library has a green roof right here in our county. We know that flooding has increased here in DuPage County, bigger homes, bigger driveways, lots of parking lots, and then the big storm events. So how can we do things at home and in our businesses to slow down some of that stormwater and reduce flooding, improve our water quality? One of the things you can do is when it's a big rain event, like it was this morning, is to not run the dishwasher, not run your washing machine. When there's a big rain event, we're all kind of inside and so we're doing household chores, but pick something like vacuuming so that you aren't using water and adding to all of that water that's going through our pipes. We can help reduce some of that flooding just by doing something different at home than laundry, showers, and running your dishwasher. Some of us, the first time we know that our car has a leak, it's by seeing spots in the driveways, um, some sort of stains or droplets. That is a great place to one, find out what your car needs to have fixed, but two, to clean it up, whether you have oil dry, kitty litter, whatever you need to, clean, need to do to clean it up, because in a storm event like this morning, all of those chemicals get washed down your driveway and into the storm drains and right directly to our rivers and streams. It doesn't go to the Water Sanitary Treatment Center, it goes right to where our turtles are and our blue herons and our fish. I learned this number a long, long time ago. Um, Americans, when we're putting gasoline into our lawnmowers and our snow blowers outside, we spill about 17 million gallons of petroleum every year just putting gasoline into our lawnmowers. So if you've got a gas powered lawnmower, really try to be very careful to not old top it over and spill it over. Make sure when you're putting gasoline in your car, you let the pump turn off and then put the pump at the nozzle back on the, on the gas pump so that you aren't dripping gasoline from your car back to the pump. Can you imagine how many drips those are across the country almost on an everyday basis? And when it rains, those chemicals go down right into our water. Maybe go to clover lawns. I planted clover last year in my front yard, so I'm excited to see how much of it comes back. Um, but you don't have to mow it. It's great for our bees. It doesn't need fertilizers and chemicals. Uh, it doesn't get very tall. So you can save yourself a lot of trouble, save yourself some money and help the environment as well. I know Jim's gonna be talking a lot about native plants, but one of the steps when an organization is earning our water quality flag is to plant native plants and for kids and church groups to understand the difference of those deep, deep roots that we have with our native plants. And those roots form huge systems to send our water to keep the soil loose and to send our water back down towards our aquifers instead of running off in floodwaters. When we're washing our cars at home, think about what you're using to wash your car. If you wanna put your car on your grass, I'll bet you'll be really careful about the kind of soap you're gonna to buy to wash your car. So think about what you're doing with your car. Sometimes I see people washing their car and then they use their hose and they hose off all the suds and so forth right down their, their driveway to the curb and then they even aim the hose at the stormwater. We are not allowed to do that. Nothing is supposed to go down the stormwater drains except stormwater. So think about how you want to clean your car, wash your car, and make sure the soap is safe enough for your grass, or take it to a car wash where it really conserves a lot of water. Road salt, you've probably seen a lot of our towns are changing what kind of salt they're using on their roads um, so that they can protect our water quality. Also, the bounce of the salt goes onto our plants um, up the curb, and then it takes a longer time for that salt to break down and it hurts our plants and our soil. So you might have seen more of our towns with these stripes on the roads. They're kind of a brownish purple stripe, and it's made out of beet juice, uses a lot less material, lasts longer. They can pre-apply it, better for the environment, better for our concrete curbs, better for our roads, better for our cars. So something really to think about when you're buying something for your sidewalk, your driveway, the parking lot of your church, the parking lot of your business, what could you be using to prevent ice from forming that also protects the environment and our water? It's, I love dogs, this is nothing against dogs, but there's 89 million dogs in America right now. That's a huge number. Most dogs go to the bathroom outside many, many times. It's really important to be a responsible pet owner 
and make sure you clean up after your dog, whether you're in a park, whether you're in a forest preserve, even in your own yard. Because again, in those big rain events, all of those chemicals from your dog's do end up in our waterways and we want to protect our waterways. 89 million dogs is a lot of dogs. So let's be sure to clean up after our own pets. When we are thinking of using hoses outside to clean our car, to water our vegetables, to fill a kid's pool, let's talk about hoses. Our hoses, many of our hoses in America have a lot of lead. And I'm thrilled to be able to tell you that most of our hardware stores now carry lead-free garden hoses. We've got one here on display, but if you just read, they'll either say lead-free on the front, or they'll say PB, the chemical kind of initials for lead, PB-free. If you read the back of a hose, sometimes it'll tell you that it contains lead and that you have to wear gloves and wash your hands after touching the hose. So many of us keep our hoses for a very, very long time, and those hoses probably have a lot of lead. So something to consider. Father's Day is coming, maybe a good present for our gardener or our dad. Choose the right fertilizer. We have a lot of phosphorus in our water, a lot of nitrogen. Our soil is pretty great here in Northern Illinois. Um, we should really think about what kind of fertilizer we need and maybe reduce the amount of fertilizer. Sometimes we use way too much. We think some is good, so lots is better, maybe not. But read the labels. It's great to have that zero for the middle number. That really will help us reduce, reduce the amount of phosphates in our water and prevent those algae blooms. We, Illinois, is responsible for a lot of those nutrients going into the Gulf of Mexico. Look at those colors. Illinois is the only state in brown both times. A lot of nitrogen and a lot of phosphorus. So we each in our own homes, in our own neighborhoods, at our businesses, at our churches, we should look at what kind of fertilizer we're using. Do we need it at all? And then how can we reduce the amount we're using? And then can we use a, a kind of fertilizer that doesn't add to this problem for our water? This is what it looks like when it gets down to the Gulf of Mexico. This is that huge dead zone um, where there's some oxygen, but not enough for, for quality life for our water creatures. So we really want to think about double check what we're using on our lawns. That is huge. You guys look at the numbers, the size of the state of New Jersey. It's huge and fish that swim into it, there is not enough oxygen for them to do well. Shrimp actually, their skin sloughs off in this dead zone. So it's really important to think about what you're doing to your lawn. So think about the pesticides, it really impacts our wildlife and it impacts our children. So do you need pesticides or are there plants you can plant that will do better because they're native. Think about what you're doing. Think about if that's what you want for your children and wildlife and our water. There are natural pesticides, baking soda and vinegar, peroxide kinds of things. There's lots you can learn from the internet about natural pesticides, something that we can um, protect our families with. One of the best things we can do to reduce pests in our yard, to reduce runoff from our yard, to make our soil absorb more water, hold more water, is to have a compost program either in a backyard bin or at your curb. So composting is pretty much putting food back into the soil, back into the cycle to make vitamins for our soil. There's all kinds of benefits, but I think some of them, there's less runoff, less erosion, fewer fertilizers needed, less pesticides, reduces compaction. Because when our soil gets compacted in our yards, water just runs off of it rather than being absorbed. It's almost as hard as concrete less watering, your plants do better. Um, the soil and the water kind of holds together. Win, win, win when you can compost in your own backyard. Or we're lucky here now in Illinois, in DuPage County, that we have 10 communities with curbside food scrap composting as well. So compost in your backyard. Check with your town to see if you're one of the towns that has curbside food scrap composting available to you. Great way to protect our water. In order to teach people a lot about composting, we started the pumpkin smash. And these are kids from Hinsdale High, South High School helping us with the pumpkin smash. We tried to find a fun way to teach people about composting, to teach people about protecting our water supply, to teach people about the value of putting those minerals and nutrients and water mass back into our soil. So kind of a win-win-win. So over the years, we're um, approaching 400 tons of pumpkins being collected for composting. And we always try to have a little sample with us of compost. 
so that people can kind of see it's, it's not soil, but it's vitamins for our soil. It's a great soil amendment that protects our water and makes a lot of fun. We have a lot of litter and wow, it seems like with the virus going on, more people are concerned about picking up any litter because we don't know how long the virus might last on an aluminum can or a plastic bottle or something. So I understand, but we've got to be really careful to make sure that we are not littering. Make sure the lid's on your garbage can. Make sure the lid is on your recycling bin. If you are cleaning up in your yard, well, please make sure that you pick up the small pieces of candy wrappers and balloon parts because all of that with rain and melting snow goes down our storm drains. And when it goes down the storm drains, again, it goes directly to our waterways. Those waterways, it's been on the news a lot to see the big garbage patches in our water. Um, the whales impacted, the albatross chicks impacted. Um, it is a, it's a giant problem. There are scientists who believe that by 2050, there'll be more plastic in our oceans by weight than there'll be fish. And that is just a scary thought for sure. So at our own homes, let's make sure we're doing the best we can not to litter. In our cars, make sure you have a bag that you can put anything in that you don't want to become litter when you open the door and the wind kind of goes through. But we have some great programs here in the county. Pick up five started in Wheaton. It's hard to think every walk that you're going on the entire time will be spent picking up litter. So maybe on one walk a year, if almost a million people in our county picked up five pieces of litter, that would be almost five million pieces of litter that wouldn't get into our waterways. That's a lot of litter. And what if done two walks a year? That's 10 million pieces of plastic and litter that wouldn't get into our waterways, wouldn't entangle our wildlife. And those nanoparticles of plastic wouldn't get into our water supply and into our air. It comes down, plastic particles now are coming down over the state of Colorado. They're measuring the plastic in our rainwater. So pick up five, sometimes schools, environmental clubs are doing it. That's my grandson, Zach. Kids are doing it all over. It's a great way to get started to help us reduce litter. But we have big community projects. We have the Prairie Path and the Great Western Trail cleanup. This year it had to be postponed. We hope it'll be back in the fall to help us clean up those great paths. We have the DuPage River Sweep, which we're hoping that people will go out and clean a little part themselves so that we don't have too many people all together. But we still need a way to get that litter up. And then we have Adopt a Highway and we have Adopt a Stream programs through the county. So there are lots of ways for all of us to help prevent that litter that garbage from getting into our waterways. We were thrilled to learn about the um, storm drain medallion project that is used uh, mostly on the east coast and the west coast. And so we brought this idea back and we were grateful. The DuPage Foundation gave us a grant and funded the first 3,000 of these medallions that we have had scout groups and neighborhood groups install on top of the curb. So on top of the storm drain or on top of the concrete next to it, we can tell people to dump no waste drains to river because a lot of people think these, goes to, these go to the sanitary treatment centers and they don't. So the kids and their sponsors are trained how to install these properly with the adhesive. They should last a good five years. They're in English and in Spanish, so we're trying to reach as many people with this project as possible so we can teach people to protect our waterways. We know that we're cleaning up here locally, um, but the stuff that we don't clean up, this young man, Chad, he lives, he grew up in East Moline, Illinois. He's been working hard to clean our rivers, really big rivers and smaller rivers. And then this gentleman, this young man, he's been on the news quite a bit. He has been working to help clean up our oceans. And now we're seeing more and more companies and organizations taking boats out, um, inventing pieces of equipment to help us pick up some of this plastics and other litter in our oceans and our waterways so that we don't have those nanoparticles getting into our fish, into our birds, and changing our water. The county and SCARES, we work really hard together um, on a fabulous project. This is the 14th year. The winner should be announced coming up this next week, but these are the High School uh, Sustainable Design Challenge students. Kids from about 18 different high schools have participated in this project over the years. Kids are taught about green roofs, permeable pavers. Um, they're taught about rain chains, all different ways to help slow down our stormwater. They're taught about energy conservation because when we conserve energy, we protect our water quality as well. 
So this is Jim Zay, chairman of the Stormwater Committee. And so they, uh, he is talking to the kids, they give their presentation, they design their models, they do all their own research. And then we're very, very lucky to work with uh, engineering companies right here in the Chicago Lane area that help us with prizes for those award-winning students. Really quite remarkable. Many of us have learned some new things that these kids have found in research. And then this is the water quality flag that uh, we've been talking about that schools are in. This is again District 93 in Carroll Street. Um, the kids paint the rain barrel, they plant native plants, they pick up litter, they talk about turning off the water when they brush their teeth and those kinds of things. So water conservation and water quality go hand in hand. And the kids are very, very proud of the flags that they earn. They've been working on it all year mostly, and so they're pretty excited to receive it. Our county is the only county with a water quality flag. It is unique to DuPage County, and it has been a lot of fun to work with. Lots of people are in it. This is the DuPage Water Commission, and some of our county board members who are on that commission, they are in both the earth flag and the water quality flag for all the great work that they do. And this is um, Elmhurst College. So libraries, park districts, colleges, kids in school, all levels, uh, all kinds of groups can earn that water quality flag. It takes a village, as we say, to get everybody on board with taking care of water quality. Uh, this is one of the really wonderful things we get to do often in the spring. This year, of course, a lot of the programs had to be uh, postponed till the fall. We hope that we'll be able to do this again, but really a wonderful project. Again, unique to DuPage County. Our county funds us to have two newsletters. They're both e-newsletters, so they're online. Um, you can sign up for them, or you can go to our website and see them all archived. But the Green Bulletin is a newsletter more for um, businesses and churches, um, park districts maybe, libraries. And then the Ripples is for teachers and people more working with kids, so a lot of scout leaders. So we talked about things that the kids can do, talk about the water quality flag. The Green Bulletin tells that the hazardous waste site is open again. So we want to make sure people know that there is a place to take the hazardous waste and it cannot go down storm drains. We all know Jacques Cousteau, I'll bet, right? Um, we need to remember that the water cycle and life cycle are really together. We all need clean water. We all need ways that we can help protect the water. Most of these ways do not cost a single cent. They just take a little common sense and a little rethinking of the products that we buy so we can protect water. Thank you very, very much. All right, great job, Kay, thank you. Um, a lot of great information in there, and right now uh, we've got some questions rolling in, so I'm going to uh, read those to you. Um, uh, one person had a question about how to dispose of gasoline soaked rags, uh, solvents, etc. That is a huge problem. We know that those gasoline rags and solvents can um, spontaneously combust. Definitely, definitely keep them open. Do not put them in a plastic bag where the heat can build up. Take them to the household hazardous waste site, lay them out and let them dry out if possible. Um, so that they aren't heavy with that, but we want to make sure it does not go in your garbage. We want to make sure you handle it correctly, make sure it stays open, and the hazardous waste site will take those. Awesome. Um, how about, uh, is anywhere open to take styrofoam? So um, we, styrofoam in Illinois, it's illegal to put it into your recycling bin. Styrofoam is number six, so styrofoam can be like a solo cup. It can be a styrofoam egg carton. Um, it can be styrofoam when you buy a television. We just recently had to buy a television and a flat screen. So we, all the styrofoam that came with it in the box, we mailed it back to the manufacturer. It didn't cost very much because it was very lightweight and let them reuse it that way. There is a company out in um, North Aurora, so it's kind of a long ways away. Uh, they take some kinds of styrofoam. You should check their website to see what kinds they take. It's kind of a, you have to think about it. Is, it. is it worth driving that far and making car pollution, you know, uh, to drive something that is um, maybe going to be reused, maybe going to be recycled? It's, it's kind of hard to know. Okay, very good. Good information. Thanks. Um, is there a video on how to use the watershed model? We don't have a video yet, but we um, are working on that e-learning right now. 
We've done little parts on videos, but we don't have one whole video about the whole project. Partly because when we're teaching adults, we say different things than when we're teaching third graders, and we say different things when we're teaching high school students. So we've got to figure out a way to make videos that are appropriate for those different levels, but we will. Okay, great. Um, how do we know which drains go to the treatment facility and which ones go directly to our waterways? All of the storm drains in the streets, all of the storm drains in the streets go to directly to our waterways. The drains in your home go to the Water Sanitary Treatment Center. And sometimes people get confused because we talk about that flooding and our infrastructure is pretty old in some areas. You might see in your community where they are lining the sanitary sewer pipes now with kind of plastic tubes because so many of those have cracked. So when we get a big rain event, that water from the rain event goes into those sanitary treatment pipes and causes flooding. So we, um, it's not a perfect system yet, but in your home, those drains go to the Water Sanitary Treatment Center. Outside in our streets and along our curbs, those go directly to rivers and streams. Great. Um, how about the, uh, the water with soap from the car washes? Where does that go? Yeah, so if you buy, if you go to, a, do you mean if you go to a car wash, a commercial? Yes, yes. Yeah, so they have tanks. Some of that water they're able to reuse to kind of get off the initial gunk of a car and they have tanks and then those tanks get um, siphoned out so that they don't go directly into our rivers and streams. They can get clean and then go to our, our direct into our water, into our water sanitary treatment center. Sorry. Okay, no, great. Thank you. Um, a couple more here. Uh, is there a law against dumping down the stormwater drain? Yes. You cannot put anything down storm drains. And I just was watching a neighbor use one of their, um, they mowed their lawn and they were using the, the leaf blower to blow all of their grass clippings into the storm drain. And so we need people to know nothing is to go to the storm drains except storm water. So there's a lot that people need to learn about what the laws are. That's one of the reasons we wrote the cooking oil law because people were frying turkeys and they didn't know what to do with four and a half gallons of cooking oil. So they were going to the storm drains thinking, well, it's vegetable cooking oil. It's not like motor oil. Well, oil's oil. It's going to float on top and nothing can go down the storm drains. Great. Um, what soap is environmentally friendly for using outside? So when you want to look for um, marine grade, you want to look for something that tells you it's safe for our water. The labels are really, um, the information is there, but you do have to read it, but you want something that is safe for wildlife, safe for our water. Uh, Method soap has some nice soaps that are safe, but you need to, everybody has different things they want to use. So read your labels before you buy it at the store. Okay, great, thank you. And uh, one final question, uh, should, old go uh, should old garden hoses be disposed of in trash or at an HHW site? So our HHW sites are not able to take hoses. They are going into the landfill right now. They should go in your garbage. Um, they're very, very dangerous. And the older the hose, the more lead. So you want to make sure those older hoses for sure go into a landfill where someday we'll figure out what to do with lead. But right now they are very, very dangerous. Okay, very good. Okay, great job, great presentation. Fantastic job answering the questions. Um, I just want to point out, I, I, I think some people are wanting to know about the presentations and the recording. So at the end of the, uh, at, after the webinar, Mary will send out a link to the presentations and to the uh, recording of the webinar and make that available to everybody. So, Kay, thank you very much. Great job. You've always been a great friend uh, to us at the county, and uh, we appreciate all your efforts. Fantastic job. I think we work together really well, and I'm really glad to be part of this. Thank you so much. Thanks, Kate. All right, great. Uh, so now we are going to uh, go over to our next presenter, and that is Jim Kleinwalker. He is with the Conservation Foundation. He is the Conservation Program Manager. Uh, Jim has been uh, on the staff at the Foundation, Conservation Foundation, for over 15 years. Uh, he's been a, a volunteer with the Foundation for over 30. Uh, he helped start the River Sweep Program in 1989. Uh, he's helped to create the Conservation at Home program 
that was initiated in 2006. And today, Jim is going to focus on landscaping issues and how we can create eco-friendly yards that can attract birds and butterflies, as well as have, help store and filter rainwater through the use of native vegetation. Uh, so with that, Jim, please take it away. Thank you very much. Well, we want to make sure that everybody knows that there's a lot of things you can do that will make their yards better. And simple things that we're going to go through today, and you'll be able to reach us and um, get the information you want. So the idea is that it's, it goes farther than just some information you learned today, that you can actually have someone as a coach to help you go through it. Our main office is on the McDonald farm. You're welcome to come down and visit it. We've got 60 protected acres with 49 in organic agriculture. We've got all the tricks and whistles on the new farm, even though the farm dates back to the 1700s. We've added solar panels and wind turbines and prairies and rain barrels, a green roof, two different types of rain harvesting systems. And it's all on one site there. You can see where the road would have gone right through the middle of the farm had it not been for the protection of the property with a conservation easement. So there's a lot to see at the farm and we can show you some of these green infrastructure practices right there in South Naperville. The reason we have to keep thinking about why would I make a change and it's better for not just the environment but it's also better for us and in this quote from Stephen Kellert, uh, an excellent book about the subject and it's going to make us feel better. Right now, even with the COVID situation, they say some of the best places you could be is outside. The sun, the UV rays are um, killing the COVID virus in the outdoor spaces and we can hike even with social distancing and enjoy the nature outside. We want to bring that same idea back to our yards. So we don't always have time to go to the forest preserve or go to the national parks. So how do we bring a little bit of nature to our own lives and solve some of the problems that we have? So these are just eight issues that I commonly see when I go out. You may have some other problems and that's why we offer home visits to help people go through specific issues that they might have with water or attracting more wildlife. Most of these issues are directly related to landscaping changes that we've done over the years, negative changes that have not worked out well. So some of the answers can be going back to the way it was years back, planting the plants from Naperville or from Illinois. So we've chosen to live in Illinois. So we're going to talk about the plants from Illinois might be a good sustainable way to go with our landscaping. The Conservation at Home program is now covering the whole region. So it doesn't matter where you live. Um, our main county has always been DuPage, but we work in Kendall, Kane, Will, and um, even out to the West counties. I'll be going out to DeKalb. But we focus on bringing information to people and helping them implement it. So it's more than just giving out brochures. We have plant sales and um, home inspections helping, helping people through it. So on residential properties, we do the conservation at home. And it's hard to see these dots, but they're scattered all across the whole Chicagoland region, people doing better things with the landscapes. We also work with park districts and not all the land in a park district is appropriate for ball fields. So creeks and lakesides, um, other areas that are low lying can be turned into conservation areas. So if we think that these conservation practices can be implemented on any kind of property that we have, then you can see how the network of, whether it's homes, parks, whatever it is, we can also make them more eco-friendly. We have a program called Conservation at Work for um, non-residential sites. These are just a few of them. We have over 200 sites that we've worked on to make them um, better including the DuPage County 421 building. We also work with municipalities. So we work with the towns that really want to bring conservation uh, as a fabric of their community. And 
the ones that really want to work closely with us, we're happy to work with them and we can dig deeper and get into all types of properties um, and make a bigger impact with the communities that are willing to do that. So where it starts is we don't give enough credit to the plants. Plants are not just a decorative thing we put in the yard. In the home, we wouldn't think of getting rid of all the functional things. You know, we need the microwave, we need the bed, we need the stove, the refrigerator, those functional things. But in the yard, we've gotten rid of function. And we've just said, oh, this is pretty, I'm gonna put it over there, that's pretty. And we've lost function in our landscape. We have to, the beginning point is that plants are the only thing that can bring food and energy to this world we live in. So thinking about plants as an essential function rather than just, is it pretty or not? So once we understand that plants are essential for all life, then it makes a difference what plant we would choose. So in this picture, this hummingbird is coming to a cardinal flower. If you don't have the right plants, you're not gonna get the hummingbird. So they scan your yard very quickly. They know what's food for them. And if they pass you by, that's because we haven't done the right things for them. We don't understand that they have needs and they're very good at filling their needs and we either have it or we don't. So the key here is these native plants, Kay touched on it, are different. We don't give them credit. In the animal world, we understand that a giraffe has this long neck to eat the acacia leaves. We understand that a, a tiger can run fast and catch the gazelle. We understand evolution, but we don't see it in the plants. So on the far left, you see grass, and it's not from Illinois, it's not from even the United States, it came from Europe, and it does not function here well. So I'm not saying we don't have any grass, it's great on Wrigley Field and other places along sidewalks, parking areas, um, but we shouldn't have it everywhere. And it's become a dominant uh, surface across the United States, actually, 39 of the lower 48 states, grass is the most dominant surface. In Illinois, there's more grass than corn and soybeans together. And I'll show you more pictures, but these roots is what makes the plants different. They're deep roots. They are working. They're filtering water. They're absorbing um, chemicals. They actually will clean the soil, the water, and the air. And they're opening up the soil so that water can percolate down. Kay talked about the runoff and it doesn't happen in these deep-rooted nature structures like these native plants have created in the root systems. This is just a picture of, can visualize compared to a human being how deep these roots can be and how fibrous they are. 25% of that root mass is cast off every year as the plant goes through winter and that all adds organic material to the soil. So the soil becomes more pervious and softer and there's food for that plant. So it makes it the food that it needs and improves the soil over time. And look what we've done with, with our pond areas. We have to understand that we did some of these things by making pond edges that are grass lined. We've made perfect habitat for geese. The geese then defecate on the grass, that washes down in the water, causing more um, nitrogen and phosphorus into the soil, into the water, and soil lines erode, and that material ends up in the lake. And why do we do things like this, either in our yards, if we live along creeks or rivers, or these ponds, when it's not particularly pretty, you don't want to put a blanket down in that grass area, you know that it's been sprayed with chemicals and goose poop all over it. So could we sell you on a more eco-friendly way and would we be tolerant of this in our parks to have a more naturalized landscape? The geese are gone. They will not walk through the native landscaping. The soil is protected by those deep roots from eroding on the shorelines. We have habitat created for other kinds of birds and butterflies. And if we can understand that these are functional working landscapes, then it makes a lot more sense. This is what we're typically seeing on our rivers and streams, 
grass does not have the deep root structure, so we have problems with erosion, and that erosion that soil will carry down through, like Kay was saying, to the Gulf of Mexico even. Another picture of uh, a homeowner's association. So would this be acceptable? Looking out across the homeowner's pond, the geese are gone, you have herons and other types of birds that you're looking at. And um, I think using these as examples, you could understand why we're, we don't wanna have the traditional shorelines like we have had in the past. So how do we apply this to a residential home? So in this home, they called, they have no birds, no butterflies, they have a problem with the water. You can see the downspout coming down there. The water pours out across the grass, ends up on the sidewalk, which is impervious, and the water sits there. During the spring and summer, they have wet shoes coming through the grass, or through the sidewalk, and in the wintertime, it becomes ice. They have to apply salt, salt kills the grass, and how would we help a little yard like this? Well, the first thing, these old arborvitaes are gone. The landscape over the years, the grass was higher than the sidewalk. So grass is good, or water will go down from the grass onto the sidewalk. And what we did was lower the landscape down so the sidewalk is higher or equal to. We created a place for that downspout to drain into what we're gonna call a rain garden. Put in those deep rooted native plants. We now have birds and butterflies coming. There's some techniques we've done like creating this grass edge on the lower right, which you have a little bit of grass there, but you can see how it's defined with an edge. It looks like it was done on purpose. The plants are in clumps and you've improved the look of the house. You've added habitat for birds and butterflies and you've taken care of the water issue and absorbed it into the ground. So we've heard a lot about the monarchs, but they're kind of the poster child for all of nature. When we do the good things for the monarchs, it'll also help the bird, the other birds and butterflies. It all works together and people just like butterflies. Not so much when I talk about bees, snakes, skunks, they don't get into that as well. So we talk a lot about butterflies. We make butterfly gardens and the bees love them too. And so we're gonna use some of these things and I'll show you how you can implement better habitat for a variety of creatures in the yard. It's also good for us. So in this picture on the left, the native plantings, that is uh, Monarda, and that is very attractive to pollinators. The pollinators then come to the Monarda and then they're able to pollinate the pear tree above it. And the garden on the right, the native plants are mixed in with the other vegetables. And so when the tomatoes are needing to be pollinated, the native plants have drawn the pollinators into that area and we get more product production from our garden areas. So it's not just good for the birds and butterflies and the water quality, it's actually better for us and more productivity of our properties. A lot of the landscaping that we have chosen is from all over the world. And you can pretty much dial in where it came from to tell you if it's a functional plant or whether it's just decorative. So you can Google any plant you want and find out where it came from. And that will tell you whether it's a functional plant doing things here, feeding our birds and butterflies, or whether it's pretty much um, just a decorative thing. Some of the plants, um, I beat up on hosta a lot just because it's everywhere, but it's the same in our landscape as something like a gazing ball or a concrete block. It just doesn't interact with the natural environment and it's not absorbing a lot of water. So we have problems with some of the areas that um, these native plants just would solve for us that these non-native ones are not doing. The picture there is lobelia. This is a good one to use in our rain gardens. It can take flooding. It has nice roots. It's very attractive to pollinators. And I'll show you some other plants that we typically would use for 
stormwater control. Birds are an easy thing to look at. 50% of the bird count were these four, and yet this is really what everybody wants. And the story behind these is all of these birds, including the bald eagle on down, one of the major sources, if not only the major source of food is bugs. And the bugs are on our native plants, and then they're there for these birds. So we can develop landscapes that are bird friendly. If in the center bottom, that's an oriole, they're all over the area right now, and they're feeding, they're gonna feed their young on insects. So having the right plants will bring the birds and solve a bunch of other problems at the same time. This is another grouping that only eats bugs. They will switch in the summer to some berries, but primarily bird, um, bug eating birds, including the top right is a bluebird. That's all it eats is bugs. So pretty much nobody's really interested in the bugs anyway, but they love the birds and uh, um, with the landscaping choices that we make. So this is a yard in Glen Ellen and conservation at home certified, and they don't have any grass in the front yard. Now maybe you don't wanna go this, to this extreme, but that's the beauty of it. For a big yard, small yard, there's multiple ways to do it. And the neighbors like it, and the people living there like it. They've got all the birds and butterflies, they don't have any issues with water. So whether it's the small yard, one I did earlier, or one like this that have taken a larger area, you can see how you could implement these conservation practices on any level that you felt comfortable with. In another area, this was a, a park in Naperville, and this was more or less a mud hole. So what do you do with a mud hole? The guy running the tractor doesn't want to go down into the mud, and you've now created in this, um, so the ditch is now what we're calling a bioswale. And it allows the water to drain down into the low spot. There's plants specifically put there for water absorption and they create butterfly habitat. There's a place for the rabbit to get away from the mower guy. Um, these were not areas that were gonna be used for ball fields anyway. So it's a win-win situation. The park district has lower maintenance cost the cost of these natural areas are about half of the cost of traditional turf. So you can see how it's better for birds and butterflies, it's better for water quality, it saves the park district money. We're all paying park district fees. So if they save money, that's good for our taxpayers too. So this site in Naperville, what do we do with things like this? And I wanna train your eye a little bit so that you see properties that are not really functioning well, eyesores, and what would we do with something like that? So we built a butterfly garden. We created a pathway so that we're trying to get people to get into it and smell the smells of the natural plants and see the birds and the butterflies and the bugs and the whatever else we might find. It's a great place to sit and relax, listen to the bird sounds and, um, when you saw the previous slide, um, there wasn't much there before. So the beauty of these is that you have someone there to help you. The Conservation Foundation will send me out or one of our other staff members and help you with plant selection, um, creating functions so that the water doesn't um, pool in any particular place, solve problems that you might have, not just aesthetic, but uh, water, other water issues, and um, we can do things even, this is a storm drain that's in Downers Grove, or a ditch alongside the road. They have a program, The all the ditches are draining down to the creek. So these are areas that are meant to um, convey water, and by planting them with these bioswales where appropriate, in Downers Grove, you're allowed to do it within certain guidelines so it's not too tall to obstruct traffic. And each of the municipalities have a little different um, programs and what they allow in the parkway. 
but this is one successful one that I worked on in Downers Grove. This orange milkweed um, in the center there, that's a butterfly attractor and it likes it drier. So it's at the top of the ditch and there's other plants that just self-selected and found their way into the bottom of the ditch where the water can be filtered. So the terms in smaller areas would be a rain garden or the bioswale is telling you in a, in a more linear type of pattern and rain barrels. If we're not gonna catch it with plants, let's catch it in the rain barrel. And I'll talk a little bit more about that at the end. Um, the whole idea that we're trying to work on here is to keep the water where it falls. So in this picture, the road or your house is high. We've engineered our properties to drain. Even if you live miles away from the river, you have these storm drains in the corner of your property in the back perhaps. And in this picture, what we're doing is planting plants on the upside of these drains that will catch the water, filter the water, keep it out of that drain. The drains there is a backup and during high water conditions, it can still function. But you can see how every drop that we keep out of the storm drain system is going to be easier to manage and cause um, less problems down the road. The other side of that pipe is where the problem is bringing it into our waterways. And even though you live miles away from the creek or the river, you don't think you have an impact. And in reality, it, there is problems with it. And that's what we're trying to solve with these landscaping um, changes. This is one that Brooke and I worked on at the farm. You can see the rubber mat in, against the building. And the water comes down the downspout follows the rubber mat. There's rocks behind me there that are gonna be put onto the, over the rubber mat to break up that water and slow it down. And we're gonna have a pretty rain garden at the end. So it solves us from having to try to mow it. That white plant is Penstemon digitalis, a native plant that has been used, uh, useful for heart medicine. The purple is spiderwort and on the, Upper edge, we have prairie drop seed that is a plant that can eat gasoline. It actually breaks up gas and oil and will metabolize that and take it into it um, into the plant and use it for food. Very useful plants and that we can use them to help things around our yard at the same time. Sedges are very useful too. There's a variety of sedges that can cover areas like grass would be um, under trees or in wet areas. We use these grass-like sedges to fill in and um, cover the ground so that we're not having open dirt that would just get eroded if um, it gets hit pelted with water. The blue lobelia and the red one here, beautiful plants that will take water and um, some of these problems in your yard can be solved through the use of these native plants. Blazing star on the left is very attractive to butterflies. So you look at a picture like this is in Geneva along the Fox River, left or right, which side is prettier? Which side's blooming in the middle of a drought? And yet we have grass covering most areas in our yard. So I can help you with that um, conversions. Look at the number we spent on grass, $40 billion. Kay talked about all the chemicals we put on our lawns, the high nitrogen fertilizer, and that is ending up a lot of it washing down the storm drains. So even the money we spend on fertilizer is not staying on our lawns. So some of these areas, this is one in Downers Grove on a um, area where Belmont goes underneath the railroad tracks and it was converted to a short growing meadow. This picture actually is at the McDonald farm where we've created a meadow planting that's 25 feet wide and 1400 lineal feet along the regional bike path. So some of these areas were using seeds and some were using plugs. There's varying techniques that you'd use for different types of property and that's the beauty of me helping you. We sell rain barrels all over the counties and ours are less expensive. They're only $60 plus tax and you can catch that really good nutrient rich water and use it on for um, plants. You can wash a car with it, give it to your pets. And 
we want to make sure that everybody knows that you're not alone, that I wouldn't know where to start is a typical question I, or comment that I get. Well, what plant would I use? Where would I get the plants? All these questions that we can help you with. And a lot of times it takes somebody to want to make a difference. And but knowing that you're not alone with it, all you have to do is have a desire and we can help you work through the specifics. So that's the Conservation at Home program in a nutshell. And I would hope you'd have questions about how you could implement it in your property. All right, Jim, thank you very much. Great presentation, good job. Uh, we do have some questions rolling in here. Uh, let's see. Uh, first question is, how can villages be convinced that it is a good idea for the economic health uh, of the village to embrace conservation practices with our creeks, parkland, and open space? Currently, my village is replacing a rock slash soil bank for a, uh, uh, along our creek for a concrete wall? Well, I think oftentimes I get um, comments from people, especially the um, elected officials, that they don't think anybody cares. So, or they, they have a feeling that people wouldn't like this or that. So I would urge you to go to the city meetings and projects that are going on to get involved and see what you could do to make the project as eco-friendly as you can. We try to make them, um, all the municipalities and places we work with, think about the environmental effects of their projects. So you could ask, have the environmental, um, the best practices been applied to this project? Okay, great, thank you. Uh, can you speak about the importance of planting in clumps? Okay, I teach at College of DuPage and other places about um, your eye is looking for uniformity and, and structure. So when things are planted in a prairie necessarily, um, it's, it's God made um, plantings that just came up where they were and there's no sense of organization or structure. So a lot of times that might be fine in the backyard, but in the front yard where people are walking along the sidewalk, they want these plantings to be clumped and purposeful in their look. So we do that with, um, instead of seeding, you would put in plants, specific plants in clumps of three or five, like other landscaping principles. And they look very organized and uh, attractive. All right, great. Um, are hostas good for soil water retention? If not, what is a good substitute for shady areas? Um, I don't want to just pick on the hosta, but the again, if you Google where it came from, uh, the daylilies, the hosta, the vinca, the uh, pachysandra, um, a lot of the typical landscapes that we have are not from Illinois, not from this area, or even the Midwest. So they don't have pollinator function. They don't have the deep roots. They are not um, acclimated to Illinois. So some of the plants you'd switch to would be right now, if you walk in the wild uh, in the um, forest preserves or parks, in the woods, you're gonna find Virginia bluebells. You're gonna find Right now I have blooming trillium and bloodroot and wild phlox and wild geraniums. Beautiful, beautiful plants. And not too many people know that say a wild geranium, the geraniums you're used to buying at Home Depot or somewhere, they don't live, they're, not, they're annuals. But the original one from Illinois is a perennial that comes back year after year after year. Same thing with petunias. The mother of the petunia is this um, prairie petunia comes back year after year. The, the decorative petunias we buy, they don't come back. So kind of understanding what's more sustainable choice. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, 
during one uh, during your presentation, one of the slides you talked about is certification for the yard. Uh, can you uh, talk about that a little bit more? And what was that certification? Sure. Uh, it's conservation at home. Probably the best place I could send you would be to our website, which is theconservationfoundation.org. There's a checklist there of things that we look for on a property. And there's information on how to contact me. I can go right to your yard and help you specifically if you need it. If somebody calls me and they say, I've got a turf yard, I probably don't need to go look at that. But if they've got uh, <laughs> problems, if they've got trees, they've got erosion, they've got issues, I can't really you know, know what exactly what it looks like. So we offer the service of coming out to help people. And then the other thing I don't think I mentioned, but we help you for free. So we have kind of a club that you can join, but that isn't required. We're gonna help you. And we get um, funding from DuPage County Stormwater to help our work because we're able to go out to those homes and help them with their flooding issues. A lot of times, very few times, someone will come out and help you for free. Yeah, that's great info. I, I think a lot of people kind of perked up when they heard that for free. So that's, that's <laughs> awesome. Um, let's see, can you tell us uh, what those undesirable bird species were on the 50% slide? English sparrows, English starlings were the two invasive species that we have um, here. The geese are native, but there's just too many of them because of our landscaping practices. And the other one was a grackle. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, we got a couple more here. Uh, how do birds like blue jays survive the winter given that they only eat bugs? Do they not eat seeds from a bird feeder? Um, oh, you have to think of the bird feeder as like a snack bar. So there, in that <laughs> picture, there was also uh, the hummingbird feeder. Now, we know we put sugar water into the hummingbird feeder and you can't live on sugar water. And that's similar to me say drinking a Pepsi, I get a little sugar rush, but it's not sustainable. All those birds are eating bugs. Um, many of the birds will migrate away in the winter. So the bluebird, swallows, all those really bug eating birds, they go away. The, the old idea of a snowbird. So they go south for the winter and eat their bugs down there. And now they're coming back now looking for our bugs and our bugs are on the native plants. So I okay. think that answered that question. You sure did. Um, are there laws that are being written to protect topsoil on commercial farmland? Uh, for example, native plantings holding water and soil in place. There are a bunch of um, laws about erosion. So I think the farmers are trying to do their best to keep that topsoil on their property. It behooves them to try to maintain that as best they can. So I think the farmers have a bunch of rules and regulations. I think where you don't have a lot of regulation is on individual homeowners. So it's up to the homeowners to kind of take the next step. Um, municipalities have rules and regulations and there's very much less on private property. All right, great. Um, the property line between my parents' house and their neighbors is always soggy. Uh, what's the best way to mitigate this? I think the concept of a rain garden, you use plants, you know, we're not going to bring a bulldozer and change the grading. So many of these low areas are part of a floodplain and they can't be filled in anyway. So you want to plant the right plant in the right place. So plants that love water get planted in these wet spots. The plants flourish and it solves some of the problems. And again, you can look up a rain garden to see what the concepts are and what kind of plants. We have a nice rain garden brochure on our website or just contact me if you think that you'd want a site visit. That, that's great. That's related to this next uh, question. Uh, can you give us uh, some of the best native plants for rain gardens just uh, off the top of your head? Oh, sure. There's a marsh liatris, a blazing star that is just beautiful. I've got um, sitting next to me right here. This is one called Queen of the Prairie. I don't think I can get too much of it in the picture, but that's a very nice one. The sedges, lobelia, 
there's a swamp milkweed. So some of the plants like milkweed, there's one that likes it dry, there's one that likes it wet, there's you know some different, even in the same family, there are different species that will take those wet spots. And I can help you with that if you didn't get it off a rain burrow for sure, a rain garden brochure. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, we got a couple more here. Uh, are there any programs that compensate uh, for installing rain barrels, replacing driveway and flow through pavers, et cetera? A few of the municipalities, Downers Grove, um, Elmhurst had a program on rain barrels where they will subsidize the cost of them. But most of the time, they're not that expensive. Um, the only difference on permeable pavers is can run more, but the idea is an investment in long-term solution rather than short-term. So the plants, okay. I mean, they start at like $4 for a plant. So we're not talking big dollars. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, is water collected in a plastic rain barrel, which is located in the sun, okay for plants? Yes. So it's the same water that comes off your roof in the in the downspout that would normally pour out in your grass. It doesn't kill the grass. You can see how the grass actually looks thicker where the downspout water has been watering it. And so you don't drink rainwater out of the rain barrel, but it's it's wonderful for plants. It's actually the difference between like a green thumb and when people say they have a black thumb, rainwater can make all the difference in how a plant grows. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, a couple more here. Uh, do you have data that compares the water runoff from a residential backyard, non-native, and native planting yard? So uh, any data? There is a lot of data on that that shows the difference between infiltration rates on native landscaping versus sod. So I don't, you know, I don't have it to share here today, but it, we have it. I can get that for you if you contact me. Okay. Um, and you may have covered this one already too, but it says what fees are involved in having the Conservation Foundation come out, plan, and do the work? We don't actually dig the holes and put the plants in the ground, but we have a, a list of contractors if you wanted to get someone to come out and do it. Um, the advice is free. If you want to join the club of conservation at home and be part of plant swapping and all of these fun things we have going on, that's a $50 fee one time. Okay. Um, let's see. I'm trying to think. I thought there was maybe another question. Uh, that might be it. Um, let's see. Uh, is Kay still with us? Kay, do you, uh, by the way, Jim, great job. Great presentation. Fantastic job answering all the questions. Um, uh, you had quite a bit of questions to answer, so great job with that. Um, I, I don't know if Kay is still with us. Does Kay have anything that she'd like to add to wrap up? I think um, a lot of the things that Jim just said were so valuable, but one specific thing about the difference in our rain barrels is our home water has chlorine in it so that we can drink it and so bacteria doesn't grow. So when you're watering your plants with your rain barrel water, there's no chlorine in that water. And chlorine, you know, burns and dries and kills bacteria. So rain barrel water is significantly better for your plants. Um, it's just a bonus for your garden and your vegetables. Uh, great, thank you, Kay. Um, uh, it looks like we have one more maybe for Jim. It says, is your assistance available to residents in Kane County or is there a group in Kane County that provides similar guidance? We cover Kane, Will, Kendall, and DuPage mainly, and then Grundy, LaSalle, DeKalb also periodically. Um, we have groups in Cook, Lake, McHenry, all over the, the area. So absolutely yes in Kane. Okay. Um, I think that's it. I don't see any other questions uh, in the uh, the chat box. Uh, so uh, great job, you guys. Uh, Jim, Kay, thank you very much. Um, I think that's all we have for right now. Uh, again, I want to thank you guys one more time for sharing your knowledge and your experiences with us. 
Uh, again, I'd like to thank all of our audience for joining us this afternoon. Uh, we hope that you have enjoyed and learned a few things from this webinar. Uh, please remember Mary Mitros will be e emailing everybody with uh, a link to the recording of this webinar as well as to the pre uh, presentations that Jim and Kay prepared. Uh, so I think that's it. With that, uh, be safe and be healthy. healthy. <laughs> Thank you very much and have a great day. Thank Thanks, you. Everybody.